Well, welcome everybody. I'm sure we'll have a few more people join us. Uh, people come in the first five minutes or so, and if not, it'll be the five of us and we'll have fun. And so for today's session, we're gonna focus on identity provider versus service provider, um, how we establish trust between them. We're gonna do some hands-on demos on how to implement them and also how to troubleshoot them. If we have time, because it's a lot of content, we're also going to look at Salesforce um, as an IDP. We're going to be looking at the first layer of identity today. Um, in a future session, we're going to go a little deeper and talk about things like connecting to social sign-on, um, OpenID Connect, OAuth, and community. So that will be a future session. For today, we'll focus on the initial parts. Um, at the end of the slides, we're going to do a quiz. I have more than 20 questions, so we're not going to be able to finish the whole thing today because we'll go for an hour. Um, but after the session, I will post the link or you can also join our Sunday morning. Uh, Sunday morning, we meet from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Um, to go through them together. So you're welcome to do either. So I'll post that on our chat. Um, I will not, the quiz you can get to right now, but we're not gonna start those questions yet. And feel free to stop me anytime you like. I like to remind everybody, I am learning this content as uh, we meet. And so if I say something that doesn't sound right, or if you have different experience, please interrupt me and add your knowledge. Um, this is a study group. Um, I am not certified to teach this content. I am studying and sharing with you what I've learned. All right, so we'll just go back to just a couple of basic terms. So what is an identity provider? And so I think a really good way to think about this is um, all of us probably have a driver's license. So that is your credentials. And when you go to the airport, when you're gonna go fly out, TSA functions as an identity provider. You go to them, you give them your ticket, you give them your license, they verify that you are who you are, and then they let you through the gate. When you get on your plane, your airline is your service provider. So your airline is what's really giving you the service. They don't check your ID again. They don't know if you're the same person that got <laughs> approved by TSA, but those service provider, they, they're trusting that the TSA did their job and that they did everything that you're supposed to. Um, in um, Computer terms, SAML is a security assertion markup language, and that is the industry protocol to share information about both requesting um, somebody's credentials, verifying them, and sending back an assertion that that was correct. That's basically your license. And here in the States, um, the States have agreed on what a license is supposed to have on it. It has to have your first name, your last name, your date of birth, and so on, your photo. And so that is the equivalent of SAML. Um, so I just wanted to compare the te uh, technical terms to something that we do in real life. Um, does that make sense? Do you guys have any questions? All right. I also want to make sure that we know that SAML is XML based. Um, so when you're taking the certification, if they ask you that um, the application is not able to provide SAML um, and they ask you how you're going to proceed with it, um, then you would um, it would give you a hint of how to proceed. Just remember, SAML is always XML based. Um, eventually, in a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about other options that use different um, coding structures, but that's SAML. Thank you, Sita. And so what is an identity provider? So we'll go back to technical terms. So an identity provider is what creates and maintains somebody's identity. They're gonna have the usernames, the passwords, and they're going to do the authentication part of somebody getting access to a system. They do store credentials. So they're gonna store a username, a password. Maybe if you're, you're doing multiple factor authentication, they're gonna be doing those additional factors as well. Examples of IDP. Salesforce itself can be an IDP. Most of us probably work in a corporate, corporate environment and we might be using Okta or Pingfederate, maybe Google, LinkedIn. Those would be some social sign-on options, but they're also IDPs. Uh, a bunch of us probably use Microsoft Azure as IDPs because uh, the goal of companies is to centralize verifying who the person is, because that way they can apply security policies and controls in a central location versus having that in different places. So that's an identity provider in computer terms. Have you guys used any other IDP vendors that you want to share? All right, let's keep going. Um, 
And so how does this work? So when you start with an identity initiated flow, and I made this simpler than some of the other ones that you'll see online, even though it still has a lot of steps. So the user goes to that identity uh, provider. So I go to my apps on dot microsoft.com. I go in there, I put in my credentials and the IDP is going to verify if the user is logged in or not and it lets them log in. After I've logged in to my apps, I can see everything that I have permission to access for my company. That of course includes Salesforce. And so from there, when I select Salesforce, um, the IDP is gonna generate a SAML assertion. And so what's important here is the IDP already knows who you are. You are already authenticated. And so it's only gonna do part of the flow and that's a SAML assertion. The uh, system will send that to the application. It's usually signed and it can be encrypted. It does not have to be encrypted, but it can be. That goes to the trusted app. That's gonna be your service provider. And so that application doesn't just let you in automatically. First, it's gonna validate the assertion. It's gonna go through and read it, make sure that the system sending you the assertion is already set up and trusted, that it's coming from the right location, that it's signed properly before it lets you into it. Once you're validated, it gives you access into the application. So this is the shorter, simpler flow because the IDP already has part of the information and it goes on to the next one. Um, so that's the identity initiated um, SAML flow. There are questions on the certification about this. So you wanna make sure that you understand the IDP initiated flow very well compared to the service provider initiated flow that we're gonna look in a second. Let's go on to that. So let's talk about a service provider. We talked about a couple of different examples, right? So a service provider is going to provide a service, might be a mobile application, might be a website, might be Salesforce as a CRM, um, but they have something that they're going to give to that user. Um, the service provider needs to be registered with the identity provider, otherwise there is no trust established. Um, and there's different ways that you set that up. And we're gonna go through that when we I show you the demo. A uh, service provider can also be known as a relying party, a client application, or a trusted app. Um, and so relying party is one that gets often used for social sign-on and a couple other ones. So again, for the certification, no. Service provider means all those things as well. Um, and again, uh, LinkedIn itself uh, can also be a service provider, right? We go into there, we look at our messages, and it's providing some services to us. Um, Salesforce experience sites are also um, service, different services that Salesforce provides. And so when, we, when you're looking at identity, you wanna be looking at, am I giving a user access to CRM Salesforce, so I'm an internal user, or am I giving Salesforce to an experience site and it's an external user, maybe it's a customer, maybe it's a partner, maybe it's an employee, but it's still a little bit different. And so when you're looking at all those services, make sure you know what kind of service you're gonna be giving, because those, um, that will affect how you set it up in the single sign-on settings. So now let's look at this flow and it's a little bit more complicated. So where this starts with the service provider, the user is going to access the application through a URL. The service provider checks if the user is logged in or not. And if they are, of course, they get access to the application, but if they're not logged in, the service provider is gonna generate a SAML request. And so the request is always created by the service provider. It's gonna sign it and send it to the IDP. So now we switch over to the IDP and the IDP is very similar to the flow that we just saw a couple minutes ago. The IDP is gonna check, are you already logged in? Because I already logged in this morning to my Microsoft app. So do I need to be verified or not? If you're not, um, if your credentials are not um, still active, then the IDP will request that you sign in again you put in your username and your password, your MFA. And once you have passed that section, the IDP is gonna generate the SAML assertion. And again, the SAML assertion comes from the IDP um, that will be signed and that will be sent back to the service provider. Service provider, once again, verifies the signature, validates the SAML assertion, and then grants access to whatever resource you requested. All of this happens through browser redirects. So anytime we're talking about SAML, we're talking about applications looking at different redirects from browsers and then bouncing back and forth between different things. Any questions about this flow or comments? So there is a question, right, from Zeta? Mm-hmm. 
Can we create time-based authentication? So from what we're going to look at today, um, the settings that we're gonna look at today do not let you do the time-based, but on your IDP, you can set how long that credential lasts. And so when we, um, when I set up, if we have time to show the Salesforce as the IDP, you set up a connected app and in the connected app, you can say how long that session lasts. Is it, does it last until it's revoked? So that one would be basically forever or does it expire after a certain time? So you can make them time-based um, and that is set on the IADP system, whether that's Salesforce or Microsoft or Okta or those things. Thanks, good question. Yeah, good question. So there is one kind of question that, that gets asked is, they give you a steps and they say then arrange it in a sequence, right? And yes. And that was kind of tricky for the for the service provider flow, right? Because when is the user authenticating? That is where I feel I I got confused. Yeah, because the what happens is you go to the service provider and you'll see when we do the demo, the service provider stores where to go get the credential verified, and that's the IDP. They're not being um, the four single sign-on for SAML, and I wanna make sure I get that right, um, the service provider is not authenticating the user. The authentication is happening on the IDP system um, because then they get redirected to that URL and then that's when the user gets challenged for the username and password if they need to. And that happens on the IDP. So definitely you wanna make sure authentic authentication happens at the IDP level. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good question. I can create as many identity provider as possible, right? Or is there a limit? Uh, you can have as many as you like. I didn't see any documentation having a limit. Um, because, and you'll see in my dev org that I have right now, I have three set up because I keep doing different variations of them. So you can have different ones. Okay. Yeah, and I'm sure there's a limit, but I don't know what it is. And I don't remember seeing in the documentation. I think as long as you have established the trusted um, relationship between Salesforce and that IDP, I, I'll have to look. That's a good question. We can find out if there's a limit. You know, Salesforce always has limits. <laughs> All right. Um, so I already mentioned this. Uh, SAML is a single sign-on is browser-based, right? So the trust is established by configuring the information between the two systems. And basically one system saves what is my what what is the URL for the system? What is the URL for another? Where am I going to go when I'm ready for the next step? And there's a lot of things that you're doing with different links. What matters though is understanding what comes from each system. And so this is what do you get from the IDP versus the service provider? So the identity provider is going to give you an um, identity certificate. Um, without the certificate, not much can happen. This is required. It's gonna give you the URL of where you do the authentication. Once again, this is required. Um, the identity provider could optionally store a certificate from the service provider, um, but this is not required. And from my experience, when I did Ping Federate, Ping Federate is required for me to give them the certificate from Salesforce, but for Azure, it's not. And so even though the certificate is still set up in Salesforce and it still expires every year or two years, depending on how you have it set up, when it expires, all you have to do is create a new one and set it up. You don't have to send it to the identity provider. But for Ping Federate, we did have to send it and do more authentication before we could proceed. So just know that the service provider certificate is optional uh, and it varies by the IDP um, requirements of what you need to do there. The ACS is the Assertion Consumer Service. Um, and then this is going to be the link that you wanna use for the service provider. So if you're going to be accessing salesforce.com CRM, you're gonna be using my domain name. That's pretty straightforward. But if you are authenticating an experience site on an IDP, this 
ACS is the link for your experience site or for your application. So that's how you can have a different link for your, um, what's called your service provider, your entity versus your ACS. Normally they're the same thing, but whenever you're giving access to an experience site, it is going to be a little bit different. Um, and of course the um, identity provider is going to be storing the user credentials, right? So they're going to say this set of users has access to Salesforce, but this set of users does not. So they're the ones that manage uh, what applications are permitted by each user. So before we go on to service provider, the information that you're getting from the um, identity provider, does that make sense? Can you tell can, can you tell us one more time uh, that stores ACS from service provider that's only applicable for for sites? It's only applicable when your service provider is offering multiple services. So let's say, let, let's use a different example than Salesforce. So let's say you're using Google and for Google, you might have a different ACS for your Gmail than you would for um, my drive, right? Because they're two different pieces of Google that you're doing services for. When you're doing an identity provider, you might say, well, Marlene has access to Gmail, but she doesn't have access to my drive. And so whenever that gets set up with your IDP, you would have um, potentially individual um, ACS for each different type of service your application is giving. And it, it all comes back to how your application is set up. If you have very distinct um, functions in your application, like the Google example, it's gonna be separate. But if it's all bundled together, like if I think about LinkedIn, um, and I'm not familiar enough with LinkedIn, but to me, LinkedIn is one application and one service, right? So I think LinkedIn would have one ACS. Um, and the same thing comes back to the experience sites. If you have one partner experience site and one customer experience site, and you're using the same IDP for both, you would set up two in your identity provider with different ACS for each. Got it. Thank you so much. Very helpful. Good. You're welcome. And so now let's hop over to service provider. So the service provider is going to generate uh, in Salesforce, generate that um, certificate. Um, certificates, I'm not diving too much into this session, but you do want to be familiar with the different kinds of certificates that you need to create for the certification. You have a self-signed certificate, you have a CA certificate, and I'm forgetting the other one right now. Um, but depending on your IDP credentials, you may need to set up different certificates um, on Salesforce, but you manage all this on the UI. Um, and once you've created it, you can download it and share it as needed. You are going to be providing the entity ID, which is going to be the URL of your application um, for Salesforce, that's my domain name. And again, for each um, experience site, it's the um, full link for that experience site. Um, and this is the ACS we're talking about, Assertion Consumer Service. Um, this is also called a start or relay URL. And again, be familiar with these terms because this is really, now that I've been authenticated by IDP, where do I go? And that's where this matters. So great, you have you have permission, but if you don't put that in here, then they don't know where to send you. Um, you're going to be storing the identity provider certificate, which is required, and this is the one that we have over here, and you're also going to be storing the login URL, which is also required, I should have required right there. Um, and so once we go through the demo, you'll see which pieces become required when you're going through it. So that's service provider. Any questions? Uh, the RSC, what certificate does that come under? Which one? RS, um, SHA, uh, you remember for um, mm -hmm. so, uh, in the IDP, we, uh, we can select either um, one RSA or SHA. I'm not uh, very, uh, I'm, I'm, I might not say, saying the right terminology. SHA, it's called SHA. You are. And so that is the, um, that's the way that your assertion is signed. And so it's basically saying, what kind of algorithm do I need to, um, um, I, my mind just went blank, basically convert. So the assertion comes in and it's, it looks like a whole bunch of letters and numbers, right? Because mm -hmm. it's written in that method that it's signed. Basically that's your signature type. And so okay. once you, yeah, once you tell them how you signed it, they use the same method to um, convert it to be something useful. Um, you can also encrypt 
your information that's not required. And if you've encrypted it, then you have an, another certificate you have to give each other, right? So if the service provider um, needs to decrypt the SAML assertion, then the identity providers can give you two certificates. One is the main one for how um, you're connect to it. And the other one is here's how you decrypt it. It could be combined, but usually it's two separate ones. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yep. And so the RSA is your signature method. Okay. Good. Other questions? All right. And I know a couple of people came in a little bit later. Um, this session is recorded and I'll post it on YouTube in the next couple of days if you want to catch up to the beginning. All right, let's keep going. So I gave you two links because I think these um, flows are extremely useful. They're from Cloud Sundial. I gave you the link and basically it goes through exactly what we've already been talking about. So this is going to be the identity um, provider initiated flow. And you can see that your browser does a whole bunch. So the way to read this is where you have the thick line, it means that this application is engaged. And so you start with the browser where um, the user is logged into the IDP. The IDP is going to generate that uh, sign and generate that SAML assertion and knows where to send it. So it goes back to the browser where it redirects it. Now the SP gets engaged. And then here they're going to be verifying how it's signed. And that's the RSA method you were talking about. It's going to validate if they're getting a SAML from a valid IDP, like who do I know who this person is or who the system is. Um, and th this is a little bit confusing because this user is already authenticated, right? So what this is what this means here is it's not authenticating the user. It's verifying that the user that they're receiving in the assertion exists on their system, right? So if you have somebody that's trying to hack into your system and just sends random um, SAML assertions and their um, different usernames, here the SP would say, wait, I don't know who the user is. So I'm not gonna let you in. So even though everything might be written correctly, you did not give me a valid username, so I can't proceed. That's what this line means. Um, and then here, um, this is where the relay state, sorry, mm, the relay state is something else, but this is where you're going, the SP is going to say, okay, now I know where to send you. You are ready to access the application. Let me send you to that uh, URL. Um, so let me take a second before I talk about real estate, relay state. Do you guys have questions about the rest of the flow? Uh, you rem remember you said that SAML is an SSO. So is SAML into other types also or? Yes, SAML can be used. So SAML is used for authenticating different kinds of users. And it can be a single sign-on where you have a user that once you're allowed to have access to it, you, you only need to remember one password and um, from one system, right? That way you can access multiple systems. But SAML can be used when you have applications connecting to Salesforce, or when you have maybe devices, like if you have, I have my air conditioning on my Wi-Fi. whenever my air conditioning is accessing um, whatever services it's connected to, it's using a device um, authentication. So there's different ways to get authenticated. And when we're talking about the different OAuth flows, which is probably a few weeks away, um, SAML is also involved there as well. Okay. But it's always Thank around you. authentication. OK, thanks. But multi-factor authentication comes also under SAML or? No, multi-factor authentication is a little bit different. And for that one, I think we did that session two weeks ago. And we went into Salesforce requirements for MFA, right? And so we talked about um, when you're required to do it, how, how to set it up. And that is different from single sign-on. And that is different from SAML. OK, thank you. Yeah. Yep. Yep, no problem. So let's talk about relay state really quick. And so a relay state is um, you want to, the relay state has to match between the IDP and the SP. Uh, where I'm a little bit confused right now why he has it here is the relay state normally comes from the SP initiated flow. So at this point, I'm just going to assume that this IDP has the relay state stored. And when it sends it to the SP, it just has to match. And you're gonna see when we're doing the demo, I'm gonna do two screens side by side. Basically the information that you put into your IDP has to match your SP. If anything does not align the way that it's set up, one system or the other is gonna say, nope, it doesn't match. And it's just gonna return an error. And the relay state is the same 
If it doesn't match between the two systems, it's just going to say, I'm not going to do anything with it. And the reason the real estate matters is because the IDP might during transit say, well, right now I'm authenticating the user. So the state changes. Now the user is authenticated and now I'm going to change the state again. But whatever they send back to the SP has to match what the SP expects. And so that would be a question for certification, right? The IDP updated the real estate through the authentication process. Um, what would you expect um, the SP to receive? And here, if you don't say it has to match exactly, it would fail. All right, let's go to the next one. Oops. And so this is the second flow that we have from um, Cloud Sundial. And this one is, um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna use my, this is identity provider. I think I gave you different links. So I'm sorry, I put the same image for both. So we're, we're not gonna go through it. Um, but when you go to the link, let's actually do that. My the image didn't change. So this is the service provider initiated um, single sign-on and I will update the presentation before we post it, but here we can go through it. So this is where it starts with a service provider. Um, I go to login.salesforce.com uh, or my domain name rather. And I, when I go to my domain name, the service provider is gonna say, wait, you're not supposed to log in here. I'm gonna send you to the place where you're actually supposed to go to. So it sends a redirect request to the browser. The browser handles that redirect and it sends the user to the actual link where that user is gonna enter their credentials. The IDP, once again, verifies are you logged in or not. You're not logged in. So we request your um, credentials. Once you have um, put in the right information, it's going to, um, I'm sorry, it's, it's gonna first uh, handle the SAML requests that came in for the service provider and say, hey, this system is asking for access, let's authenticate the user. When they are successfully authenticated, it's going to generate the, um, the SAML assertion, which here he's got response, but this is wrong. This is the assertion that goes back. Um, and then we're gonna go back to the browser. And again, you see the dance back and forth, right? So the way to think about this is, where am I in my dance steps? Am I the service provider? Am I the IDP? And what's bouncing back and forth? Um, and for your certification, you wanna be very familiar with both of these flows. Questions? So whenever it's an SP initiated SSO, then the SML response or the assertion comes first, right? Yes, the SP creates the SAML request and the IDP sends the SAML response in the form of a SAML assertion. Okay. Yeah, and the way that I've put it in my head is, SP is request, IDP is assertion or response. And that would be an easy question on the certification. Uh, when they're asking you the sequence of what you get, I would think one of the answers would flip those around just to make sure that you know where they're coming from. And assertion will have a time limit or something, right? That's a good point. So the request that comes and the time limit are both. I've heard, I have not validated this yet. I've heard 15 minutes that when you send it, if you don't respond within the correct time and send it back between systems, it's gonna say basically, no, your request is too old. I'm not gonna handle it. And that's also a really good question because um, I'm watching the Ladies Be Architects videos. Um, I do that in the mornings as I'm getting ready. And one of them mentioned um, that when you're doing this, you wanna make sure that your server times are aligned because if you have different time zones on your servers, that would always make your um, timestamps be wrong and not be accepted. So that's a really good point. These do expire, they don't last forever. When else can it fail? Sorry, I spoke over somebody. No, sorry, sorry. So I'm gonna show you how to set it up and I'm gonna do happy path on how it works. And then we're gonna start to break it together because I, as I've been studying this, there's a couple of things that I did that um, I made certain assumptions and they caused errors. And so those errors that you get are really useful. The help docs have a whole list of errors that you get back, but I'll show you the common ones. Okay, so it's uh, the timestamp or this time based are for both, right? For either yeah. 
Okay. Yes. yes. Both the request and the assertion both have a time limit. If the system doesn't receive it within the window that it expects it, it rejects it just based on that. Okay. And you you put that into the IDP uh, in the IDP provide. Um, I'll need to research that because when I look at my setup for single sign-on, I don't see where I where I set that up. I just know, I remember hearing from the Ladies Be Architects um, videos, it was 15 minutes, but those videos are also four years old. So it's something good for us to verify because I don't know the exact answer. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah but great question. Um, so now let's go back to... I was under the impression that the times are on the server, the server's times. They are, but the time that they take to expire, I think that's between the IDP and the SP to, as a setting, um, yeah. because you're right, the server times, if they don't, if you're not in the same time zone for both of your servers, that's going to make you um, error out uh, by default. Yeah. There we go. So where did they go? All right, so here we are. I'll, I'll update the image here. And so now let's um, implement Salesforce as a service provider. This is a good chunk of the test. I wanna say it's like, I don't know, 17%, 18%. It, it's a pretty big part of it. So you wanna be very comfortable with what happens when Salesforce is a service provider. And so you're gonna gather the information you need from your identity provider. You need the certificate we talked about. Uh, a minimum, you need the issuer URL and the login URL. Um, you're going to need to enable your My Domain Name. After you've done that, you'll set up single sign-on. And when you set up your single sign-on, you're going to be entering the information you gathered from the identity provider. Um, your identity ID is your domain name. Once you've done that, you're going to enable uh, federated single sign-on um, using SAML setting in um, setup. And once you've done that, you're going to update my domain name one more time to add your new authentication service for single sign-on. You also wanna make sure that your users have been updated with whatever they're expecting to be logging in as. Um, most of the time you're gonna be using the federation ID. And so let's look at those steps one by one in an actual org. So I have... Let's see how we're gonna do. I am going to put this on another screen. And so what I'm going to do right now is I'm gonna walk us through, there's a, a module called set up single sign on for your internal users on Trailhead. And we're gonna basically do that together. And so this walks you through all the steps that we're gonna be talking about. And we're gonna be using the Axiom um, Heroku app because they give it to us. And then we'll use, um, Salesforce is an IDP later on. And so the first thing they want you to do is they want you to make sure you have a user with a federation ID. And so here I have a user. I've already set myself up. Um, I have an SP user, my service provider, and I made my federation ID really easy. <laughs> One, two, three, four, um, because that will make it easy for me to put it into the next system. Um, once I've done that, um, I'm going to go to the Heroku application and here it walks you through each one of the steps that you're going to be entering into your single sign-on. And so I have um, here, single sign-on. And the way you find single sign-on is you go to single sign-on settings. And I want to show you two things. When you have single sign-on settings, I mean, this is where you enable SAML enabled. Um, and you're able to set up your single sign-on without having this checked. So I'm going to uncheck it. And here you can see that I have a couple of single sign-on applications already set up. Here's the Axiom one. And so since I've turned this off, if I go to this domain name and I try to do single sign-on, it's obviously not going to work. But then I can add new ones here. And I think somebody asked about the limit of how many you can have. I don't know what that limit is, but we should find out. Uh, but you can add as many as you like here. Um, eventually, I expect myself to have some here for social sign-on and for like Google and LinkedIn, because I'll keep playing with those features um, as I'm studying for this. Um, and I've even done this multiple times. Um, and the key here is 
you either enable your single sign-on all at once for everybody, for all of the services, or not at all. You can't activate one individual um, option from this screen. There's somewhere else where you do it. But here, they're either all on or all off. There is no Axiom is going to be on and um, my Salesforce IDP is going to be off. Does that make sense? And then the other thing is um, a long time ago, the Federation ID was, um, if you don't check this, it's case sensitive. And so Marlene with a capital M is going to function differently than Marlene with a lowercase m. This was causing me a lot of problems a couple of years ago with Ping Federate because sometimes Ping Federate would enter the uh, Federation ID in all lowercase and sometimes it would be mixed case. And so we, we were having a lot of problems because of that reason and we would open tickets and we'd have to go chase it to get it fixed. Um, eventually, I wanna say about two years ago, Salesforce added this feature that you can make it so that it's case insensitive. So it doesn't matter how it comes in, Salesforce is gonna treat it as the same no matter what. Your Federation ID is um, alphanumeric, so letters and numbers. Um, and I don't think it allows special characters, um, but that's something that we can verify. So now let me go into Axiom. So I'm gonna set up a new one. So here, this name can be whatever you want it to be. Look, I already did the two one. Your API is automatically entered, but you can update it as needed. So here's your issuer. So now let's go side by side because it'll be a little bit easier. So here my issuer is, since I'm using Axiom as my app and copy and paste as your friend, as you guys know, um, because that way you make sure that you don't have any typos like I will you asked what kind of errors you can get. Um, I don't remember if it lets you do it or not, but we're going to try. I'm gonna to go to my domain name and again, copy and paste because my entity ID for this org is my domain name. I've already downloaded the certificate from um, Axiom a few times. And so now I'm gonna upload it. And the very first time you do this, Salesforce wants you to um, request a certificate. This certificate will be named um, a little bit random by Salesforce. And it's very difficult a year or two down the line to figure out which certificate ties to what. So I strongly recommend that when this gets created, you go into your certificates and you rename them um, because the name that's defaulted by Salesforce does not tell you that the certificate is being used for single sign-on or for something else. You might have a certificate for chatbots. You might have a certificate for different applications and it's a little bit hard to find them. So here, I only have one right now. The other thing that I would recommend is when you do it this way, Salesforce um, creates a certificate for you. But what that does is by default, it creates a certificate that is key size of 2048. This key, uh, this certificate will expire in one year and it needs to be redone in one year. Once it's been created, I cannot change anything on it but the name. So all I can do here is rename it. However, if I create a new self-signed certificate, I can choose my key size to be 4096. This will last two years, less maintenance, right? And so SSO 4096, and I like to date my stuff. Hopefully you're naming it something that makes sense to you. Hopefully you have it documented somewhere so you can um, figure out what that means later. So now I'm gonna save it. And so now I know what that means. And this key doesn't expire for two years. And so um, you can see here expiration date is 2025 instead of 2024. Um, but again, these are things that you don't have to do. You can choose the existing key. Uh, we're gonna save this and update it with the other key in a second. And then here, you guys asked, how do you sign your key? Um, RSA um, SHA-256 is more secure than SHA-1. So it is a best practice to choose this one instead. Your encryption can be optional. You do not wanna select the certificate that you just created. You wanna select a certificate you create that the IDP gives you because the IDP is the one that's gonna tell you how to decrypt it. And so you should not be using your own certificate. I will leave it um, not encrypted for now. Here you choose how you're gonna be getting the information from your IDP. Is the IDP gonna send you a username 
or is it going to send you a federation ID? Almost always it's federation IDs because systems don't have the same format for usernames. A username in your IDP might just be first letter, um, initial and last name, and it's not email based or it might be email based. The other thing is you cannot reuse usernames across any Salesforce org. So I don't know if you've ever encountered that issue, but if somebody creates your username in the sandbox with your email address and they try to do the same thing in production, they get an error saying this user already exists. You cannot do that. It does not tell you where they exist. Um, and so if you're a member of multiple Salesforce orgs, you end up potentially with an issue. So a username causes a lot of um, potential um, issues down the line. So Federation ID is best practice and way more common. Um, if you, um, you can also do um, the user ID, but then your IDP system has to know your Salesforce ID numbers. And again, that's not particularly common. It's possible, but not common. So we'll keep with Federation ID. And then here um, you have the name identifier. Is it going to be in the subject or is it going to be somewhere else? If you select identities in the attribute element, then a couple more things are required. Your attribute name is not required because you're saying go find it somewhere else. And then the format. I'm not going to do that because I don't have that in my org. So I'm going to leave it as the subject, which again is far more common. All this information you get from your IDP system as to what it is that they require for you to do. Axiom is pretty straightforward. So it, we're just going to keep the easy stuff. We're going to redirect. So right now I'm going to leave the identity URL blank. Um, because I want to show you what happens when you do that. You can see it's not required. You can also enter URLs for logout URLs and then for error URLs. So you can customize all of these, but it's not required. You can also do single sign up. So before we save that, I'm going to show you one more thing. When you create single sign on, you can also do user provisioning. When you do user provisioning, you get a couple of options. You can either do standard, which is out of the box Salesforce. Anytime your IDP sends you a new SAML assertion, it's going to check does this person exist or not. If they don't exist, it's going to create them. And if they do exist, it's going to update them. If you want to make more updates to how that user gets created or updated, you can write or create your own Apex class. And then it's going to ask you, okay, what is your handler? Um, and what user should you be executing this as? And I don't think... I don't have anything in here. So I'm going to go back to doing, I'm going to uncheck this because right now for our demo, we're not going to go into just-in-time provisioning. When we do the community um, sessions, we're going to go deeper into just-in-time provisioning because it really matters a whole lot more there for customer creation and partner creation. Um, but keep in mind, you are able to do user provisioning with single sign-on and you have both the out-of-the-box option for standard creation, and then you have the ability to customize that to your heart content. So I'll uncheck that. And I'm going to get an error right now, I think. So I'm going to save it, but I want to show you the error. And so a couple of, um, looks like I already, it's telling me I already used that. It's like, it doesn't want me to use it. So I'm going to change my name. I copied my domain name straight from my domain name page and I forgot that it requires HTTPS. So, and this one, this one will fail if you don't do HTTP. So I'll just show you because it'll once again, oh, it didn't fail. Um, but if you don't do HTTPS, you get errors down the line. So I have found that it's better to make both of these HTTPS and you really want your IDP and service provider to be communicating securely anyway. So even though you can, you should not do this because it's going to cause a problem. It looks like I forgot my certificate. So let me go give it again. Okay. Um, so now let me save it. And so now let me save it. And here it is. And so if we go back to our steps, so we've gathered our information. I already had enabled my domain name, so I didn't do that step. I set up the single sign-on. I've already made sure that my user has a federated um, credential on it, so that's done. But now I need to go update my domain name. So let me go back to my domain name and I'm gonna refresh the screen. And um, 
down at the bottom, you have authentication configuration. And here, right now, I only have login form set up. So I'm gonna hit edit. And you can see, I don't see my um, Axiom 3 set up here. It's just not showing up. And the reason for that is because when I set this up, I did not put a custom provider URL. So because I didn't do a URL, my domain name page doesn't have anywhere to send this user to. So I will change that. And I'm going to edit. And while we're at it, we're going to change the, the certificate to the one that we created. That's the two-year one. And here you can see whatever certificate exists in your org, you can select from. And this is where if you have them named correctly, it's much easier to pick the right one than if you leave the generic name that Salesforce provides. All right, now we're gonna refresh this. Maybe, what am I doing wrong? Oh, do you guys know what I'm doing wrong? Did you guys catch what I missed? No. So when I go back to single sign-on settings, I had disabled oh. um, SAML. Yep, because you can set up as many single sign-ons as you want, but it's disabled. So until re-enable it, it's not going to work. So now let's re-enable it. And so this is a great troubleshooting step, right? Why can't somebody single sign-on? It's like, well, did somebody accidentally turn it off? When you create a sandbox, um, sandboxes have this automatically turned off because they don't want to have a problem with logging in. So um, if you have a full sandbox and you're expecting to do single sign-on, that could potentially be a problem. So now I've re-enabled it. So now let's refresh again. And now I have all my various types of um, Axiom ones that I have, and I have some other things that I've done. This is the one that I just created. Um, and so it's here. I'm gonna use my old one because I know that one works fine. And so I'm gonna save it. And let's go to the incognito window. And so here at the bottom, you can see I have login with Axiom SSO. So that's the one that I just set up. So right now I'm, my, I'm in, in my service provider org. I'm gonna go to login with Axiom. And then here, um, we're going to start with Bob. Uh, we're going to test this out. So here I have Bob, and you can see that my entity ID is SAML Salesforce. But if you guys remember, that's not what we set up, right? We set up our entity ID to be my domain name. So when I'm testing this, I'm going to, again, copy and paste to make sure everything is correct. And Bob does not exist in my org. I'm doing something to give me an error on purpose. I'm gonna request my SAML response. This is what's nice about this Heroku app. It lets you test things little by little. So here it gives you your SAML response in plain text or formatted. They're the same thing. They're just formatted differently. I'm gonna copy my SAML response to show you in a second what, how you can troubleshoot. I'm gonna log in. And there's an error, but this isn't particularly helpful, right? Like, you know, what happened? So let's go back over here. I'm the, gonna go to SAML assertion validation. The federal ID was one, two, three, four, right? But you've given it was. the username. It was, well, I just said Bob because I wanted something to be fake. Mm -hmm. um, and here it looks like I have a few errors, right? So this is, when you go to the SAML um, assertion, it will show you the last error, which is very handy, but it doesn't always do that. Um, and so if it shows you the last one and you have low volume, that's great. But if you don't, you can generate your own response and see what it is. So it says response issuer did not match the issuer configure on single sign-on settings. Um, issuer, and it tells you right here, the issuer from my settings is, so what's the difference? And look the same. Is there an empty space or something? Oh, it's blank. Well, it's blank. The issue for my assertion is blank, and the issue for my settings is that. So basically, the for some reason, the Axiom one didn't work. And so one of the things that I'm going to do, because I'm definitely playing with Remember, I did a second one today. 
So the start one, I'm going to delete it because I haven't tested it. So I don't know that it's working properly. I still have Axiom SSO. And then here I have Axiom SSO. So let's and see, it took me back to my domain name because that's what I had asked it to do. And it's usually best practice to start with a fresh brand new incognito window because it removes a lot of potential issues. So I'm back to my login page and I'm gonna try to log in again. Here's that. Oh, I didn't put an issuer when I did it. That was my mistake. The issuer needs to be Axiom. And so over here for Axiom, my issuer is Axiom SSO. And since I had that blank, when that got to the system, it said, no, we don't know who you are. So this one, we are gonna do one, two, three, four to make it a successful one. So now I have my issuer URL, which I missed the last time. My recipient URL and entity URL are the same thing. And this is my startup page, which is this page. And again, all of this has to match exactly what you have in your single sign-on. One mistake that I made one time is on my issuer, I had a slash all the way at the end, but I did not have it here. So it didn't match, so it failed. And it's very literal on what it's looking for. So we're gonna request it again and we're gonna log in. And success, it works. And so now if I go back to, because this is incognito window, if I go back to this one and I go to SAML assertion, see it's telling me it's unable to map to the subject, but we just saw I succeed, right? And so this is looking at the prior um, SMLs, which is why I had copied that, and we're gonna validate it. And this time, this is the one that succeeded, and it takes you step by step. And so it tells you everything that you see in green, you know it happened correctly. And so this tool is very useful to go figure out what might have gone wrong with your system. Um, let me see. So right now we're talking about the SAML validator. And so um, let's play with a couple other things. So we're going to Close my incognito window. And one of the mistakes that I made as well is I copied my domain name from up here. But if you notice, once you're logged in to Salesforce, it adds lightning on it. And when I added lightning to it, and we're just gonna do it here. I know very well that it's gonna fail, but I wanna show you the error. I have the right federation ID. I have the right issuer. I just have the wrong recipient URL because they're not gonna match. So I'm gonna request my SAML response and I know it's gonna fail. So I'm just gonna copy it. And over here, I'm gonna replace it and hit validate again. And now I have it read. So now it's telling me that my audience is a problem because my domain name doesn't match. So I have lightning in one, but not in the other. Um, and then here, what it's expecting is no lightning, um, but it received lightning, right? So it's telling you what to go check. Um, and so sometimes these errors are a little bit cryptic and you have to kind of read them line by line to make sure you understand what's going on with them. But for um, the certification purposes, you wanna make sure that you know, um, and going back to the sequence of events, you wanna know what's being checked at each step. You wanna know the sequence and you wanna know that you have a SAML validator where you can enter um, the SAML um, assertions and see where they're going wrong. So we have about four minutes left. We're not gonna have time for the quiz today. I'm gonna leave the quiz for Sunday. So hopefully you guys can join. If you can't join, I will publish the quiz after Sunday um, on LinkedIn and on this page. So you'll be able to have it back and then we'll be able to go through it. I think, um, so only one person on here has seen the quiz before. Um, so before I move on, any questions? Thank you, Marlene. It was really good. You went through each and everything. <laughs> You're welcome. And so if you wanna to go to the page really quick, we can try one question. 
and then um and so do you guys have the link for the quiz let me put it i'll put it back in chat in case you didn't see it oops Oh, where is it? No, I think this is my link. <clears throat> it has not started though, that's it. Oh, is that the problem? So let me go over here. Let's present it. There we go. It's asking for an access code. Um, if you go to the link. Sorry, probably I've done some mistake, yeah. No, no, you're okay. If you go to the link, because this is my other browser, it should be showing you this page. So I'm gonna hide this page. Guys, and then here's my presentation mode. And so it looks like we have three participants. I'm one of them. Do you see me? Um, uh, I don't, um, it's not showing me people yet. We'll see them in the next one. Um, and definitely, I love your feedback. As, you, as I shared in the beginning, I'm learning and I'm just taking notes and you'll see the kind of questions that I ask. Um, and that way, again, on Sunday, you'll see the rest of the questions or I'll publish them on LinkedIn and any feedback is welcome. So. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, so now let's go to the next one. That way you get an idea of what these questions are like. Oops, ah, that's in the wrong place. So now you can pick, you can put in your name. One time we had Darth Vader. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, and so now we're gonna start the quiz. And so I have 24 questions, so let's do two and then we'll wrap up. So what configuration information do you need from the service provider? Select four options. Uh -oh. And so the service provider does not give you the issuer ID. The issuer ID comes from your identity provider. Your service provider gives you your entity ID, your assertion consumer service, because that's going to be your experience site. It's going to tell you where to find your subject, federation ID, or username. And it could give you a certificate. It's just not required. Um, and so here you can see we can have fun. Uh, and by the way, I forgot because I got it wrong too. I'm one of these four. <laughs> so let's do one more question together. And so question two, what is the correct sequence for IDP initiated login flow? And these you get to move around. IDP
15 seconds. Oops. And so here's the right sequence. So first the IDP has to check whether the user's logged in or not. If they're not logged in, it checks the credentials for non-authenticated users. The IDP shows the applications that user is approved to use. The user will select the app. The um, IDP generates the SAML assertion and sends that to the application. The app validates the assertion and then the user accesses the app. Thank you everybody for joining today. I hope um, you guys had fun. And on Sunday, we will look at the other, and we're probably gonna start from the beginning. Um, on Sunday, we'll just do all 24 questions together. And that way you can see how you did. If you can't join, don't worry. I know time zones can be a challenge. I will post the link after Sunday. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you.